Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast. I'm joined by my co-host Steve Nutter and guest today from Digital Foundry, John Linneman. We're going to talk about BVM, CRTs, tinting, dodgy repair jobs. We've got it all. John, Steve, welcome boys. Thank you oh, very much. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah, thank you, John, for joining us today. It's fantastic. Um, you and I have been talking back and forth about CRT stuff for a while, so I'm really excited uh, to get you to come on and just get into your love for the format. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, without too much time for me getting into it, why don't you go ahead? Um, I'm sure that most people watching this know who you are, but if you like, want to have a brief sure. introduction of yourself, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, so I'm John from Digital Foundry, as you mentioned, which we're a YouTube channel that does sort of like a technical look at video games. Uh, we kind of started modern stuff, but I've kind of taken over the, the retro side of things as well, doing DF Retro. We have a Patreon at digitalfoundry.net, and yeah, we're we're doing pretty well for ourselves, playing lots of games, talking tech, uh, digging back into classic stuff, and of course, I have continue to profess my love for CRTs on that channel in other places. So <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. I know uh, j- just like I know. And most people may know, know this, but you're in Europe. So yeah. this is always a fun topic to talk about, like your journey, uh, maybe into like actually getting back into seriously CRTs. Like where, what, what exactly started you on that path? What was like your first, professional crt was there any story behind maybe how you got sure um so i i've long been a crt believer going back you know i i had always used them for video games and the first time i used a flat panel lcd it was immediately clear that it was bad i was like okay this this looks terrible the motion clarity is bad uh upscaling games it looks bad uh, it was not a good time. You know, I did get into plasma TVs for a while, and I do like plasma, but it's not quite CRT level. Uh, close enough, but it's not quite there. So I continued to use CRTs for classic gaming for up until, like, 2013 when I went to Europe, basically. So I, I have, but back in the States, I mostly just had consumer sets. I had a bunch of Sony Trinitrons. Some of them were the one, like, I still had my model that I bought myself back in the day. Uh, but personally, I and I, I have a bad habit of doing this. I would keep buying new displays until I found one that I really liked. So like I first got like a Panasonic, which was all right, but it had some issues with the, with for a while it started showing retrace lines and I couldn't figure out why. And you kind of hit the thing in the side and it would snap into to action. And this was like not an old CRT, right? So, but it was cheap. I, I didn't bother getting it repaired. I just gave it away. Then I got a Toshiba 20, 20 inch uh, CRT, which was pretty good. Wanted to go up to 27 inch, got a Panasonic that supported uh, HD resolutions. And unfortunately, it did not do interlaced under 240p very well. So I got rid of that a year later. And then I got a really nice Sony Trinitron that I've kept. And that is still in storage back in the US. So when I went to Europe, though, I was like, all right, I got to leave CRTs behind. And I was <laughs> sad. Uh, so I, that's when I got into, like, the Frame Meister and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I had a Plasma TV, a uh, 50-inch Pioneer that I still own. I, I love that TV. And it was good, but even with the Frame Meister, I always felt like something was not quite right. Uh, and I just could never really... Retro games started to feel off to me. You, you know what I mean? Where it's like that little bit of extra input lag because the plasma had 50 millisecond of lag. It wasn't the fastest. The frame meister mm-hmm. has a couple frames of lag. So the games just it never felt right. And then um, when I was visiting a friend in Germany once, he just happened to still have a CRT hooked up. Uh, it just clicked with me. It reminded me like, oh yeah, these things are amazing. So I, I guess it was like 2016 when we were in Germany then that I started getting back into them, searching on eBay Kleinenzeigen, which is like a, the <laughs> Craigslist equivalent. And I found a Sony PV20 M2E for 180 bucks. So, and it was, you know, about 150 kilometers away. So a little bit of a drive. I hopped in the car, uh, drove over to that dude's house and there it was and picked it up. And I was very happy with it. But then 
I started seeing other CRTs pop up for sale. And <laughs> now I think I have nine CRTs in my house, and that's probably as much as I can handle at the moment. Uh, <laughs> it, I ended up getting three 20L4s, uh, a BVM, um, an FW900, a couple other PC monitors, uh, and a consumer one, which we'll talk about, which wasn't great. And so, uh, long story short, I guess I got a lot of CRTs over the years <laughs> because I was kind of buying them before things blew up. So I mm. paid about between 180 and 250 for all of them. I also got some, I paid less for these, but I also got some of those little nine inch ones, which I have lying around. Mm. So it means I have more than nine, but. Uh, those... Where were you typically finding these? Just on the the eBay Craigslist or some yeah. other places? Any it's trends? Always, it's always been that. It was just mm. that, that eBay clients I can like just search. I have a a saved search on there, and every <laughs> time they pop up, it was a mix. Like one of my L fours, which by the way, the twenty L four, the sister monitor to the twenty L five, it's like identical yeah. chassis, the exact same tube, everything's the same except it's not multi format, which sucks. Because Europe multi format yeah. stuff was extremely uncommon. They really didn't do that here. Uh outside of the D series BVMs. So yeah, that was a but I actually picked it up from like an actual editing shop in Frankfurt. Just went down there and these video editors like, Oh yeah, we this was our monitor. We bought this new and just was just sitting in the back for a while. If you want it, go for it. <laughs> no, like, yeah. So it's like, yeah, I'll take it. So when you got that first uh, 20M2, was it a situation where you had been reading about them for a while or you already like PVMs oh, were already on your radar for the they, most part? I was very aware of them. Uh, my friend of mine back in the States, like, you know, as, as early as 2007, had a, one of those wow. 80s era mm. Sony B, or PVMs. Uh, oh, the 27 inches with the, the black casing, you know, the big cube. He had one of those, so I was like, man, that thing's awesome. Uh, but by the time I was looking into it, those were kind of old at that point. And, you know, I was thinking, I don't want something that old. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with the age, but it's more like I was worried about servicing it, right? Uh, so, yeah. you know, I was looking for other things, and just aren't that common. It's the newer stuff that's more common, I think. So, yeah, I, I, I knew that I wanted one, and I found it online, and that's when I went for it. And ever since then, you know, the reason I always go for these things, and yes, consumer CRT is totally fine. Nothing wrong with them, but the benefit of these PVMs really is just, like, the precision you get with things like the geometry and the color accuracy, and the it just eliminates some of the flaws that CRTs <laughs> tend to have, right? Like, the consumer sets, the, the picture just isn't usually as perfect uh and that's what eventually led me to get this bvm that i use because like that lets you electronically dial in you know like the just every single thing you could generate uh including like the geometry you can get so perfect that i have like a little black edge around the screen with, like a perfect square for for the various inputs and you save each one as a preset on the little front panel and everything and uh it's it's ridiculous and i love it <laughs> <laughs> but John, you were talking about yeah. like that you had uh, consumer CRTs, like you were talking about your 27s and you had a bunch of them. Uh, when did you become aware of like, hey, there's a thing called 240p or here's this 480i, like understanding the differences between analog video in your work? Did you just always get it ever since the OG days or well, when did you start to understand what this all was? Yeah, I, I kind of got that back in the day. Uh, I, mean, I only started doing this work in 2013. I was in IT before that. so, But just for fun, I, I think the first time it really clicked with me was when I got that EDTV panic and suddenly realized, like, wait a minute, like it's not, it does, it's not displaying the classic games correctly, right? No scan lines. It doesn't look right. It's upscaled. I could tell only there that it was treating it as like interlaced content. And that's basically when I was aware of this whole 240p thing uh, in terms of like handling it correctly or not. Right. Yeah. Sure. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we got right now. So the thing that you were 
tweeting about this week and, and, and got a few of us talking was the tinting on a BVM or a, any monitor, which I think a lot of us haven't really thought of. So start us off. Why did you think to put tint <laughs> on the monitor? Okay, so... <laughs> I mean, you look around at any monitor and they're like an OLED screen or something, right? And when it's off, the panel itself is just jet black, super dark black, right? Uh, a lot of consumer CRTs, especially PC monitors, are also this way. Like, you actually get this nice black-looking tube. You might have noticed that all the, pretty much all the professional monitors, except for I found like the medical Sony's, the ones the white Sony's intended for medical use which do seem to have a tinting on them, most of them have no tinting. And it seems to me that this has been intentional for, like, maximum color accuracy with, like, zero influence from any sort of tint. They just wanted the raw glass with, like, perfect accuracy that then be used in, like, a dark room or with one of those, like, shades around it, right? Like, that, I think that was the professional intent. So you just have this very gray-looking glass, right? And that's professional stuff but when it comes to actually using these things especially if you're like in a lit room uh it really washes out the picture and i always felt it kind of killed the contrast like see you're to really great black levels but you kind of lose that when the glass itself is like absorbing light and it just ends up looking gray so it's kind of defeating the purpose of that as the crt and it's been driving me nuts for years <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what pushed me to. So, what do you do? do so, you went and got found glass tint, like that would be for a car, or where are you getting yes. you get the tint from? That is well, exactly I was going to say, yeah, you get you like, I think it was probably six months ago, maybe. John had reached out to me asking me if I had any ideas, and the original thought was yep. trying to a little bit mimic what uh, B and O did with their screens, how they almost. They kind of have a That's, glass yes, overlay they do. that is tinted. And then I started thinking about like the couple of Sony's that are really old. that are 12 inches and they're like 1270 Q's, very old ones, uh, all analog. And they have a glass pane in front of the tube. And you could do the same thing with that. And then, I, I mean, I, I was, I kind of, you know, life got in the way. And then all of a sudden I look over and yeah, John had, done this tinting <laughs> and um so but i had you know lewis and i had talked to another couple or we talked to andy king he had done this maybe a couple months ago tinted a crt uh and then it, so we kind of started seeing that maybe this was going to be something but since you did it i really wanted to kind of get your ideas on like how uh, so start us off like how did you get started what was was there a bit of trial and error here yeah what was the big challenge so uh, it's interesting you mentioned that so yeah i did message you a while ago because i have been thinking about this for some time and it i did initially the glass idea because of the bnos those bno crts are very common in europe they're everywhere mm -hmm. and they're pretty cool actually uh you know they kind of have like an old arcade monitor look to it but yeah, they have this this tinted dark glass over the tube itself. And I thought about doing that. But getting an exact match or like exact size would be tricky and expensive. And I wasn't sure I wanted to like spend that money without knowing if it would actually be effective. Uh, and so I got thinking more about, all right, on the, on the BV, they have those little removable frames that click off and you can like put a different bezel type in there. And I thought, what about making a... Uh, like a custom bezel that has like tinting in. and I kind of played around with that idea for a while and tried different materials and I just couldn't find anything that would really be durable enough to like fit the curve of the screen and not show like issues and then mm. last year I did actually attempt to use like some window tinting but the color was weird on it and I had some issues with it like being applied and uh, I kind of wrote that off until I saw that article from Andy King who he actually huh. showed it in progress. And I was like, that's exactly what I've been trying to do. And I think it's just this idea that somebody did it and I could actually see that somebody did it that made me say, wait, maybe I can actually do this. You know what I mean? It's like that little extra push that I, I yeah. wasn't insane to try this. So I was like, All right, somebody actually did this. I think I can probably do this as well. And so I started shopping for, for tint film uh, for a car, basically, like her car windows. 
Uh, I tried samples of different darkness types. Specifically, I, I just went with two. VLT 20% and VLT 35%. And the 20% looked really like a glass, like in testing. But it was really dark. Like, it's so dark that it kind of, like, almost halved the, uh, the brightness output from the monitor. And the only way to make it look okay is to, like, go in there and, like, really dial up everything. And I didn't want to run the BVM at, like, basically in torch mode all the time. Uh, it's not, not a great idea. <laughs> also, you know, BVMs have that, uh, they have the auto brightness limiting anyway. So, like, when it goes yeah. too bright, you get the overload lamp and then it, like, dims it down. It's actually kind of like a moderate screen in that sense. They do the yeah. exact same thing. Uh, so I was triggering the ABL like crazy with that and like, all right, this is, this is not going to work. I can't do this. So I took that off 5%, did some tests with it. And I was like, okay, this actually, this looks really, really good. And then I decided, all right, let's, let's give this a shot. And the thing about the BVMs that's nice is that, uh, not just that little clickable bezel, but the whole front bezel is very easy to remove. Right? You just take off the sides and there's literally four screws or whatever and it just lifts right off and you get full access to the tube versus like say the 20L4, 20L5 where uh, taking those apart I want them to be extremely annoying especially around that stupid power button, that long piece of plastic. <laughs> like the, the whole thing is just a, it's a big mess. So I didn't yeah. want to I didn't want to try it on those. So I actually did, I got the whole tinting kit. I got my white gloves and everything and the spray bottle and all these different types of like uh, <laughs> plastic wedges to sort of set thing on there. And uh, I just went for it. And the initial test didn't work great. And so I removed it. And then the second one, I got it just right on there. And I actually, they, you know, did all the spray on there, you know, slowly pushed it out, got everything on there cleanly. Uh, I spent over an hour just, like, getting bubbles out, you know, just moving the little uh -huh. bubble with the little pa plastic squeegee uh, mm -hmm. until I got them out to the edge. And in the end, there's only, like, there's two little tiny bubbles left that I just couldn't quite get out. And I got to do, they're not very noticeable, but for my first time doing a, a tint like that, I'll take it. It looks good enough. And yeah, so I put it on there. I used a little bit of a hair dryer, nice and smooth and, like... <laughs> on the glass and uh it looks it's completely like a game changer i cannot believe how much better it actually looks with this and it completely changed my opinion of that type of uh screen on a bright day because for a while i felt like i could only really use it if i closed all the shutters uh but you know now i can leave the window wash amazing it's like beautiful dark pitch love it so if if i would say if somebody has the nerve to try this and better black levels absolutely give it a, give it a look i had never done window tinting in my life and it turned out really good and i'm surprised <laughs> at how like factory it looks like it doesn't look like like it's like an artificial thing applied to it really looks like a proper tint job and i i really did you watch that. some youtube videos to learn how to do the i did the squeegee across the i did screen? i yeah. went you guys like putting tint on cars and i was like all right <laughs> the difference there is like they're like so crazy with the spray bottle and because they're working just like in a window and i'm like well i don't want to do that because i got like those <laughs> tube and electronics behind there so i had to be a little bit more careful with the water you know <laughs> but, yeah but yeah it worked i couldn't That's great. believe it I mean, it, just see it, see it that and how quick it's kind of gone from um, now I see people asking about it. I think it's something that will really go kind of crazy if people start doing it. I mean, especially like you said, the certain models where it's easy to get to the full access of the tube. Uh, yeah. But I was even thinking about doing it, you know, but it would only be something where, again, I have like the, the medical ones, like the one you had originally, like I would have to be in a job where I'm taking the entire thing apart uh to be able to get to the tube because that one's much harder but certain yeah. ones like you have are much easier yeah all those bvms they're like they're really great for that i mean it really made me realize how those bvms were truly designed to be 100 percent modular right like it's like oh the tube is out you know just take off this bell yeah. swap the tube 
you know, one of the cards is bad. Yeah, like everything is so easily removable on those things. It's it's truly awesome. Uh, whereas the other ones less so. I think the thing that really got me thinking about it is because of that initial that I got, which has a pretty dark tint on it. And then when I first got the 20L4 and put that in, I was like, well, this is a better tube. But I noticed it was super washed out looking because of this gray uh, glass. And I pretty much found that all all the Sony CRTs that have 800 lines or higher have this problem. I Well, I say problem, like it's not actually problem in the sense like this is how they this is how they were intended to be right like this is how sony designed them it's just a problem for our use case right and i actually think the worst ones are the the d bvms like the d24 the d20 or like a friend of mine has like three d32s at his house which is just insane uh yeah <laughs> I know. that's heavy that is heavy that <laughs> they're 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 table size. You could actually like yeah. on one of those things. It's ridiculous. But those <laughs> things have like you know that needs it bad. Those those monitors, I think, because they just don't look great in a lit room. You have to close the blinds. No, they're to use they're them. designed to be in literal darkness and run yeah. even at. It's funny you mentioned about running the overload. A lot of BVMs were the um, the hardware's more powerful than the tube itself a lot of times could handle and they would yeah. have i'm reading old service bulletins where it would say if your tube if you hear a loud pop in your <laughs> d24 and your tube stops working <laughs> and you start hearing about a loud violent sound of it call the technician and then it says in there <laughs> install a new overload board and uh swap out the picture tube oh my god it would go so much higher than the actual um I'm glad we got that service now. Yeah. But gee, it's just popped. My BVM's <laughs> yeah. blow. What do I do? Oh. Sonny. Oh. Like, oh, sorry, Paramount Studios. You're going to have to yeah. buy a new tube the, for oh, those, a those new $50,000 tube. Man. The, the, yeah. the D24s and D32s, they seem real sensitive. Like, you really. They are super them. duper sensitive. I try to like advise people away from them most of the time. Yeah. I, just because I of that. About because them, they could. Like, yeah. And uh, you always have to almost be servicing them regularly. It's more, hmm. um, and it's it's because they're doing crazy things. Now, one of the yeah. other things about the tenting, real quickly, um, this really helps, like you said, certain tubes better than others. And there are some even more extreme cases, whereas if, for example, you removed, if you had a big bunch of uh, gashes or like those, bubble up looking uh degradation of the screen on like your fw 900 yeah, yeah, yeah if you yeah. were to remove the tube uh or the coating on that it would go extremely lighter and impact the picture quality a lot i i did and that this would be way. like this you what i did that my fw 900 the the film is gone and okay it was quite quite damaged and yeah it's uh it's really hard to see <laughs> not a <laughs> Unless you're in a pitch black room, yeah. So what you so added you could, back to the F to the nine hundred, no, and I now it's too dark. It, I have not done it yet. What I'm saying is, okay. I, I removed the original <laughs> anti glare coating. It was damaged, oh, and I okay. now that I've done this tint, I feel like I I've worked up enough confidence to go into the FW nine hundred and basically add it back. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Awesome. Yeah. Now that's a great idea, and I think that's. Like there's those and JVC ones that are really bad, if you remove it. Um, oh so. yeah, 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 yeah. The Sony ones, like most of them, they're grayish, but they were designed to be used that way. Uh, but if you remove the the anti-reflective layer, then yeah, it gets pretty bad. So, but sometimes it's the only way to get rid of like deep scratch in those things, right? If the glass got scratched, it's usually not the glass itself; it's that layer mm -hmm. that gets damaged. And it's nice that it's removable. But you just got to have a solution to sort of restore that contrast. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what it might be for others who don't think that they have the tinting skills to do it themselves. They're going to haul the CRT down to their local auto workshop, <laughs> take it into the oh. guy and be like, yo, not window. No, no. Tint the thing, the monitor. Tint this. I... I mean, I, I suspect they could do it very well. I'd just be worried about the applic process, seeing how... Okay. Watching the, those guys do it, the shop with the water and stuff, like, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Speaking of uh, repair shops, what um, what we talked about kind of your experience of being able to find the PVMs and stuff, but um, how, how have you dealt with uh, maintenance over the years? Because surely you've had something pop yeah. up on them if you've owned them for that long. Exactly. So capacitor stuff isn't usually a big uh, I can do some light work on that. And then I have another friend who's better than I am at that, that can handle it. But when you get to the more serious stuff, uh, like, so one of my twenties developed a problem in 2020 and I've never actually been able to fix it. And I don't know what was wrong with it. It's still, the monitor still works, but it occasionally gets into this bout where like something is arcing, causing the picture to kind of like click and flash. And uh, I ended up just using that monitor as a dedicated Tate screen now, where it's like sideways. And ever since I put it sideways, it has not done that at all. So <laughs> I, I don't know, like, did something just shift in there that it's like no yeah. longer triggering the issue? But I actually took that one. There's a, there's a fellow here known in Germany uh, named Winnie, who's is quite, quite an eclectic fellow. He's an older man who was a T CRT repair technician Weird, right that's what he did uh but he lives you know a few hours north of me so i went on a pilgrimage with this thing in 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 tow up to his his workshop and it was out up there he lived way out in the middle of nowhere you go into this back and he's just got crts like everywhere and the thing i did learn though is like he doesn't actually like on on these pro monitors at all like he's trained in the more consumer stuff and the older types of monitors he doesn't like getting into the electronics as much, right? Like he'll yeah, do all okay, the cap yeah. stuff and deal with all the the boards and and watching him work is pretty funny because he's he'll, he's like tapping on the deflection board and other things with like a screwdriver to see what it does and just like I've never seen somebody <laughs> mend your tea like that. Like he's got it powered up, it's on, and he's just shoving his hands yeah. in there and like clicking on things. And I'm like, all right, you know what you're doing, dude. And that's apparently just what he does. Uh, oh, it's no problem. <laughs> So, I so which monitors did you take to him? Uh, there was just that L4, one of the 20 L4s. Okay. Uh, and that was actually the oh, reason I got goodness. two more. Because I was like, I want them to die, so I better get more. <laughs> so I did. Uh, and, yeah, he, he felt that there was something going on in, in the neck on the, on the tube. That something possibly, like, inside the tube was slightly off. And like he found, like just tapping it the right way would trigger that. And he's, there's probably nothing we can do here because it's not the electronics. He pulled off the neck board and all the boards. We recapped a bunch of stuff, did a bunch of like reworking of things, and it had zero effect on it. And he's in the tube. And like you can either just like get rid of it, you know, or just keep using it and see what happens. And the the situation it never actually got worse. In fact, sideways it got better. So. <laughs> That one is still in service. Uh, it seems okay for the moment. Knock on wood. The other, you know, the other ones have not them, but super weird stuff. But that experience was the thing that kind of got me used to working inside the CRTs a bit myself. So, you know, of course I all around the high voltage components as you need to be. Uh, but, you know, it kind of pushed me to like, all right, I think I can do this stuff. I'm not going to be as crazy as this guy and just like tap <laughs> with a this, screwdriver. This, this leads to so much follow-up stuff here. Hang on. <laughs> so the funny part about all this is, is I'm strangely getting like these visions of my future here where I'm the <laughs> crazy guy out in the woods that people are driving hours to, to get yeah. CRTs fixed. But beyond that, we're laughing about the safety here. If this dude ever gets shocked, how far away is he from a doctor? <laughs> Would he even bother to have anybody call? Or he just, I don't know. Oh, I just woke up from being shocked like eight hours later out of the floor. <laughs> like the dog he licking his he's, face. He's been shocked a few times. He says, oh, it's fine. It doesn't hurt that much. <laughs> <laughs> he's still here to tell the tale. Uh, yeah, this, your, your friend so Winnie, he's, um, <laughs> you guys are all in like the former West Germany, right? So he grew up in... Like, he's back in the day, he was doing it in West Germany, not in the yeah, East. Yeah, 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 correct, correct, yeah. In okay. West Germany. Was, only yeah. because that has a relevance. That's, that What are the access to the CRTs you have access to? And yeah, uh, as yeah, I yeah. talk, Steve and I talk about a lot, I find a lot of old Soviet sets 
out here and they're oh, all wow. RF and there's something going on that I think they're CCAM only because oh, wow. the USSR yeah. had a deal with France at the time. France. So, stuff. and then I know I've got a, a friend of mine who I need to sit down with, to have a chat to. He was a, a, a broadcast engineer during those days when they had wow. to switch over from CCAM to PAL because that's what <laughs> the rest of Europe was doing. So I find with these older people in Europe, you got to dig in a little bit. They've usually got some stories about those good old days. Yeah, no, he, he's definitely, he's been around and yeah, doing it in West Germany. And mm-hmm. he's worked on just an absurd number of CRTs over the years. And I've never he just loose tubes everywhere. Like he's just got shelves and shelves of tubes of different sizes, yeah. all carefully placed and just so much stuff up there and now he's actually he's known here for help like there's a lot of those people that run like arcades in germany right where they have like 100 machines and you come and pay what flat fee and you get in right he kind of travels around germany and out uh the arcade owners repairs their crts get that stuff all working and in good order so he's very helpful in that regard and he's so he's kind of retired but like he still loves seattle out there uh, working on them and, and, and helping people out. And it's, uh, the problem is, is there's just not many people doing it, right? Like he's the only one that I know of that really things, uh, it's, it's pretty rare these days and that's becoming a problem. Yeah. Well, for keeping of course. Them alive. Yeah. It's the traveling CRT repair band. Yeah, that's exactly. A romantic lifestyle wandering it's the country. Literally, yeah, literally the big, <laughs> most often question I get is what do you tell is, uh is not what do you do it's what do you tell people you do like that's what people ask me like what do you tell people you do and what's their reaction is the like, that's the question i get now because it's literally like you say there's no um there's there's like a couple people i know in the u.s that do it and that's not yeah. not that many i'm sure there's no. others but they're gonna be guys like what you're saying that are just they're retired from doing it and they might do it and they don't, most of them aren't on the internet, you know, nope, openly not really. solicit bet business. Um, so, but so you, you do you go, word. have you, have you taken things back to him since that one visit? Uh, I haven't gone back to him. I stay in touch occasionally, but I haven't had to do that. The only other things I've needed to, to work on is like cap stuff, which I don't need to go all the way to him for that, right? Like this was more like serious diagnosis of a, a problem that I just could not figure out on my own. So, <laughs> but, but when you, you tell John, when you tell yeah. people about this, okay, particularly in Germany, yeah, like if you say to just a regular person, maybe in America they know what cathode ray tube is, but for for a second English as a second language, people don't generally know what a cathode ray tube is, so they end up know. going box tv or then i say yeah, the estonian yeah, yeah. word for it kinoscope do you have to say the german word before people know what the fuck you're talking about i don't you know you just it's really just like say it's like an old tv like you know the old okay. tv the big ones and it's like yeah. that's enough to trigger people uh yeah, it's yeah, the same with TV, um, like, yeah. looking for pc monitors the way you do it pc crts you go on to, the, to one of those like craigslist like sites you search for like PC monitor and then you sort by cheapest to most expensive. And then people <laughs> that have these things, they don't, they don't know it's a CRT. They don't know anything about that. This is, they have this big old heavy box and it's a computer monitor. That's what they know. And that's how you find them for usually. It's just like, oh, I have this old monitor. I want to get rid of it. Right. The ones that put like retro TV and stuff like that in there, they're always going to like jack the cost way and try to get way more than it actually deserves <laughs> but the people that just the selling this stuff for uh you know a, a more fair price uh they they, they don't know the, the specifics let me get rid of it <laughs> i think in in estonia we've all our CT, crts have dried up crts have dried up in this small market but that's oh, it's man. really recent that's only within i would say the last year I'd say, or, or 18 months. Before that, it was uh, heaven. Before that, it was uh, oh, it man. was the golden age. How are things for you in Germany? Uh, let's just say you're a regular, you, you want to do some retro gaming. I don't know, anywhere in Germany. I'm not sure. How far do you think you got to go to find a, like, I don't know, a reasonable set for 30 uh, bucks, something, you know, reasonable? From In your from town, am I going to be driving 100 kilometers, you reckon? Everything I've seen so far on the market 
what what's basically happened is the price since I was initially buying up all my tubes, the prices have basically mm -hmm. tripled. What okay. I could have found for two hundred before is now at least six hundred, right? In the uh, pro monitor space, you mean? Yeah, in the pro monitor space. Okay. Uh, where and then you're starting to see people move TRTs, and if they, if again, if they use the word retro, uh, they're yeah. gonna be like, yeah, I want one hundred fifty or two hundred for this old crappy PAL thing, and you're like, so you <laughs> you can actually still find a good a good amount of these uh, pro CRTs online if you search, uh. I won't say it's like it is starting to get a little harder to find, but they are still definitely out there. And I see them regularly pop up here and there. Um, I actually saw I saw one pop up that I really wanted to get, but I just missed it. Uh, somebody sold a 20 inch A series BVM with the original analog card, and it sold for like mm. less than 200. No. But, and I, I saw uh, that. I was like, oh my god! I reached out immediately, yeah. and he's like, "Oh, sorry." It's like, wow, a lot of people wanted this monitor. He got like twenty messages, yeah. and it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's when you're like, "Oh my gosh, I got it!" Yeah, be first in line to get that. I, one. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, "Oh my god, I met a man." I need. <laughs> Oh, uh, the that the a the a series is a really really good uh, good monitor. And um, I that was the very first one I ever bought accidentally off eBay was oh. an A20 without the yep. analog card, of course. Without the card. And I just saw four spots in the back and thought, oh, that's got to be RGB and sync. No, it's like <laughs> SDI nope. and HDSDI in and out. And uh, But I was yeah. lucky. I went to this place where I used to salvage CRTs and pro stuff. They would call me if they got it. And I went in there oh, one time, great. and they had they had salvaged an entire, um, like news station, in a big city, and they had a piles of just crap. And on top oh. of the pile was a no joke the BKM sixty eight X. I was walking around the junk piles. Oh my god! And I and I saw it, and I about like like started sweating. But I wanted to be. I didn't want this guy to know this <laughs> card was so rare. It was I was valuable, like, hey, yeah. can you just let me throw it in with my palette of stuff i'm buying and he's like sure take it i don't care <laughs> and i was like yeah <laughs> but i had already sold the a20 oh. because i didn't and oh, that was no. like years later so i never oh, i no. never got to use it with my a20 <laughs> gosh darn things yeah that stuff mm -hmm. is uh wild yeah that's uh companies getting rid of stuff like uh my neighbor he works for radio which also that same building and like in it and I was. I asked him. I was like, "Hey, yeah, if you have any of those old pro monitors, let me know." And he's like, "What do they look like?" And I took him into the house. Was like, "It looks like this," and he's like, "Oh yeah, I've seen some of those. Let me go check." And then he, "Yeah, we used to have a bunch of those, but they threw them all out." And I was like, <laughs> "Shit!" <laughs> <laughs> it's like then you start. Then you start. Um, I start wondering, like, how can we get on the investigative trail? Because there's a good chance these are sitting. <laughs> Either in a warehouse I, or like a landfill somewhere. It's yeah, like people are chasing so. magic cards in landfills. Soon they'll be we'll be running around looking exactly twenty L fives that were thrown in a landfill. One one thing I have to talk about here is you know obviously with CRTs being starting to become the uh, there's a red flag in Europe and it's called one hundred hertz. And I think Steve, mm. you had never actually really or weren't familiar with these, or at least haven't used one. No, no, I've never used one. I've I've just I, watched a couple of videos of people trying to work around it. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. I had heard about this for years. This hertz screen, don't get a hundred hertz screen. I was always like, okay, this doesn't sound great, but I, I'm curious what it looks like. But I didn't intentionally try to find out. It's more that a friend was like, oh yeah, his relative, this JVC. Uh, it was actually 28 inch, not 27. It was a 28 inch JVC. Sent me some pictures. It's got multiple SCART inputs on the back. Uh, supports NT. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll give that a look. That looks all right. So, you know, I pick it up from from him. Uh, put it in the car. You know, drive home. Get it out. Bring haul. It's nice and heavy. So you know, carrying it up there. I'm like, all right, let me put it in and give it a sh shot set it up on the table 
plug everything in, and then right when I'm looking for the power button, I see your power button. It says 100 hertz. Nice. And I was just like, <laughs> all right, all right, let's see what this looks like. So I, uh, you know, I hook up uh, a Genesis with a SCAR cable, uh, running some Sonic on there, turn it on, get a picture, and <laughs> so what it does. So the idea here is, so 50 hertz, if you've not seen it, and I'm sure plenty of everybody in CRT land has seen it now, it's very visibly flickery, right? It is higher, there's lines of resolution, but it is, it flickers. You actually see the thing flicker. Like 60 hertz, you can see flicker too, but 50 hertz is a lot more intense, especially on like a white screen. This is how TV was broadcast in Europe, it seems, for CRTs. Even though a lot of CRTs do support 60 hertz, the default like signal was 50. So they came up with this solution to solve the flicker problem. And it's a digital solution, it seems. So it takes the analog input into some sort of circuit board that then processes the image and the idea of reframe. So you have one frame and then essentially shows that frame a second time. And the result is that you get to 100 hertz. So yeah, no more flicker. But the problem there is lean every frame. If you're playing, say, a game and it's scrolling, you now see effectively a double image. So every edge has like... Uh, a, like a ghost image behind it. Hey, if you play a 60 frames per second game on a 120 hertz monitor in 120 hertz mode, uh, like playing on an Xbox, you set your Xbox to 120 hertz output, play a 60, it's going to do the same thing. The thing is, though, is on a flat panel, unless you're using black frame insertion, you won't actually see the double image effect because the, the motion resolution is too poor. There's too much persistence, so it just blurs together and nobody notices. But on a CRT with its perfect motion resolution, you really mm. see it, and everything has these awful gaps. And then on top of that, it E as interlaced. So basically what it looked like was one of those type. It's like when you plug uh, into one of those HDTV CRTs, you plug a 240 blurry and upscaled looking, and then you have the double ghost image. And it, for whatever reason, detected it as 16 by 9, and I didn't have the remote handy, and I couldn't change it to 4 by 3. It's a super squished, like, blurry, ugly, non-properly handled image that with, like, you know, ghost trails on everything. And I was just like, I love everything. And I put it out in the garage, and I was just like, well, I need to figure out what to do with this now. Uh you didn't so, get a chance uh, to test like actual VHS video or something like that on it just to see does it actually look good with its intended uh, purpose? Well, I did plug it oh, into to a laser disc player and yeah. okay. I, I no, I, I don't like it. It's it's not <laughs> horrific, I guess, but it's still these TVs look like running interlaced content on a four eighty P capable uh CRT. Only mm. this isn't capable, so everything looks upscaled. And I, I just, I, it's bad early two thousands digital circuitry that does a really yeah. nasty job <laughs> right. with these signals, and add it just, and it seemed to add <laughs> some input lag as well. I, I okay. didn't actually test it, but it, it, it felt not as uh, crisp as it should. Thing is oh bad, and this sucks because the problem is, is a lot of the later, like after two thousand one, two thousand two, all the high end CRT sold in Europe moved to this hundred or this hundred hertz stuff. Hmm. So like you got these beautiful looking tubes, like nicely engineered, that if you paired it with the right electronics would look so darn good. They're stuck with this awful digital circuitry that destroys the image. And so there's this black hole where, like, you don't want anything in this era unless you can absolutely confirm that it 100 hertz. So it's, it is sometimes hard to confirm as well. Like, you only it saw it because it had 100 hertz on the button. It's yep. not always obvious on the label nope. on the back. Nope. You've got it. I've had to multiple times go doubt, find the service manual on some sort of weird back end internet site or something, get the PDF, plow through it, and eventually in the specification see. 50 100 or or something like that yeah there's and been a number of speaking of those sellers that when they're selling crts they're like retro uh <laughs> and they jack up the price and then sell one of those 
Like there's a, a number hertz? of them. There was one that ended yesterday. The oh. dude had a hundred oh, hertz no. Sony Trinitron, and it's oh, like retro, gosh. high price. It's he wanted a so hundred euros it. for it. Hundred euros. You're smart enough to know it's retro, not smart enough to know that a hundred hertz is the worst, Nobody worst, worst. It. Of course, it would sell. No one's buying See, that shit. So that hundred bucks. This is all crazy because this, these things don't exist here in the U.S. <laughs> and I kind of wish they do because it would present this whole I guarantee you there'll be this whole sect of like yeah. a Reddit group that is dedicated to like defending these things to the death <laughs> and swearing that there's nothing wrong with them they would in be. the United States that would totally be a thing oh. and then uh, the other thing is we don't get the hilarity of the retro I mean that would be a real confusing problem if you're trying to buy a CRT yeah. and you think you even found a retro one and it's a hundred hertz set I know, dude. It has happened. This is the only time I actually mistakenly ended up with one. But there's been several where people were like, "Hey, I got this nice Trinitron. <laughs> you want it?" I'm like, "Oh man, that looks great." Yeah. And then I look into it. And it's like, "No thanks. Put it in the garbage." Yeah. It's like a. It's like the cursed set because, like you said, now you've got you've got one just on your hands. Now I got you one. Know. I'm like, well, I can't, <laughs> what do I do I can't with it believe it. Why? Like anybody that would actually yeah. want a CRT now wouldn't want this. Yeah, you'd literally be doing them like getting them mad at us. It's like, how do I make somebody not think a CRT is cool? That's the way. <laughs> I'll give you them gotta the put it, now. Hertz. You got to put it on eBay. Retro, super special, very rare, hundred hertz. <laughs> yeah. Someone's gonna be like John Lindemann sending a hundred hertz set. Oh my god. So oh, I was going to no, find that... your local eBay listing. <laughs> See, the funny thing is though, is that there there is a almost north american equivalent not nearly as bad but i don't know if you guys remember flag of scan velocity modulation does that sound familiar what what's the no. svm so in the early 2000s a lot of crt started shipping with scan velocity mod look it up it's essentially hmm. it's designed i guess to create a sharper image by i guess modulating like the speed or something of the beam or or the of the uh yeah so uh the problem is that it's essentially like equivalent to artificial sharpness like a sharpness setting but look to it and during this period when i was buying new tvs like at best buy like new crts and shopping around there were CRTs you could buy that had forced the higher end ones. You could go into the menu and turn it off, no problem. I could do that on the, the Toshiba and the Sony and all that, no problem. But then there was others where or certain models where you couldn't turn it off, stuck with this awful, hmm. overly sharp looking image. And it's really bad. Like it, it looked, it basically ruined the image. And it was dish effort during that time to make the crts look like i guess sharper it was really designed for for video content like you know normal analog television and arguably could maybe improve that a little bit but for like a a game system it was a terrible thing and yeah, yeah so that was that what makes we did to watch out for sense. that makes so, a lot of sense because the, the you know i like to ref we like to refer to the displaced gamers uh, video on like NTSC video and signals mm -hmm. and how it was developed and like what it is actually going on there. And one of the things I learned about NTSC as composed to like PAL and other regions is NTSC needed a lot of color correction on the end, basically user end. So the sets yeah. in America that are NTSC over the whole time period were, were used to trying to build in all kinds of comb filtering, all yep. kinds of uh, picture processing to do color correction based on whatever was programmed in the set itself. And that wasn't as big of a problem in PAL. Oh, man. Actually, I, I just typed this in to, to, to search it again and immediately comes up with a video of some guy uh, with, with a Toshiba and a JVC CRT. He's got to like, yeah, show it. If you unplug this little cable on the neck board, you can turn off scan velocity modulation. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it wasn't just sharpness, I see. It was also, it was made a punchier contrast. And the idea oh was my. that it would, the beam would move faster in, in dark content. 
or and then slower break content or the reverse. You varied the speed of the of the actual beam as it moved across the display and painted the phosphors basically. Wow. And it's a it's a bad idea though. It doesn't see in this <laughs> video were... cracked me up because I remember uh, a friend of mine did have a TV that had this problem because I had a 2001 Toshiba that it was optional, but then he got there which was uh, manufactured by a different company, like internally, and that had forced SVM, and it was just awful. So it was a weird time for CRTs. I feel like late 90s was probably the best era for CRTs mm -hmm. before they got too crazy with trying to come up with these digital innovations and to mess with the image. So Yeah, so in 1998, <laughs> like, the, the patent had run out for the Trinitron, you know, protecting it where you have oh, to basically yeah, yeah. go. And so other companies would come in and, and <laughs> finally be able to show off their copies of the Trinitron. Mm. That's why you end up with a lot of these Tron monitors that are really good that aren't made by Sony at all in the early, late nineties, early two thousands. But then like you say, we've always talked about this getting into that digital transition where stuff's going, obviously yeah. the picture and everything's going towards digital. You can't keep, using the CRT, but until this flat screen's totally ready, how do we sell these new CRTs and try to make them do better things? And you could see this oh. early on with like even just JVC consumer sets where they manu or they have a locked in red push in the image. Just yeah, simple that's... things like that. It's like why even that do that? Right. So it's it's a fun it's a fun yeah. period, yeah, but yeah. I think that you're ending up, like you say, with thank goodness we don't have a lot of those over here those hundred hertz or they'd be in the landfill everywhere i feel like yeah and uh, that's kind of what's happened here it is it There's is really nothing though. to do with them yeah no thinking back i mentioned that old panasonic that first like 1999 or something that had the retrace line issue i think i actually caused that myself because uh <laughs> right when i bought it you know loving to tinker the very first day is like oh, there's this thing called the service menu, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> so if I just put in this code, I get into the service menu, so I was tweaking it. And I remember I did something that caused the screen to... And then when you turn it back on and the screen would get really bright and then just shut off. And I remember trying to quickly input code on the remote <laughs> and managed to get it work. I think after that, it screwed something up and I could never figure out what it was. And over time, it just got really kind of messed up. So I think I had probably damaged it. <laughs> That's when I learned, back to the service menu, don't just don't just go around in there and press buttons, you know? <laughs> no, know what you're actually clicking on. Well, this is something I, I get a lot of times. People will ask me about going into their service menu on their Pro CRT, or really any of them, and go into the factory reset. Oh, and and a lot of times people do it and they don't end up with an issue, but sometimes you get where a CRT will come out of a certain region and the original yep, yep. factory reset goes and puts it in a completely different region mode than oh. you're operating in for the country. And so you can, I mean, I've seen them where it's like, I can't get it to turn back on because now it's in a different zone for maybe even power. Like, and I'm like, well, I don't know. Yeah, you should. That's why I don't really do do? advise yeah. against doing a factory reset most of the time, unless you know exactly what's going to happen to it. And someone else I has do, already done it. Uh, that, those resets can be useful sometimes for certain things. Like in the BVMs, you can reset individual cards. And I uh, want to, I, you know, again, one of the best things to replaceable cards. So the deflection board on my BVM, it was, it was having a slight wobble. And I was like, okay, this needs to be recapped. But Actually, somebody had contacted me with a completely new set, same model. So I basically have a duplicate of every card for this thing. And I swapped in the this other deflection board, and it looked like it had all these weird lines through it, and things looked completely wrong. Was the card bad? And that's what was my first thought. But then after doing a factory reset on the card, or at least, you know, it completely fixed it, and it was fine. And it just oh, turns wow. out that those two have completely different settings in the menu if i put the old one back in it also has a problem until i run the reset so basically i i couldn't just swap those two cards 
which also makes me think that needed to be recapped. Uh, maybe the settings had been changed along with it and it was having issues. And then those settings don't work correctly with the newer, with uh, a card mm-hmm. it doesn't. So it could be related to that, but it did kind of save my butt there. Yeah, that makes, that's good. And that makes a lot of sense where as time goes on on a card, it gets a lot of hours on it and those caps do f- wear out and you're overcompensating yep, yep. by manipulating the settings and you can mm. do that with a BVM because then you're like, well, I can still stretch it and make it look great with the capability yeah, yeah, of the yeah. BVM. But like you said, then you slide in a card that's fresh, new, and it's like looks insane. That's all messed with- up. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't Yeah, that's so. the BVMs are interesting because they're so tweakable. Especially things like convergence, you can just nail it. But they're so tweakable that I feel like if you're not really an enthusiast, you have to be very careful with there's basically they take off all the limiters, I would say on all the settings and they say well if you want to crank this stuff up beyond safe <laughs> beyond the safety there's point no, uh, there's no warning you really no besides warning. <laughs> you need to set everything up as much as you want and blow up the monitor it's so you got which you don't know careful. when you're doing your tint how far you could turn up the brightness uh, i know i, I would I turn up the brightness i cannot I, I imagine know. being in the testing lab for this equipment you know oh. back in the day where they're like Look how much they're like, all right, you got to be careful because look at this. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to show you right now. I could just turn this up right here and boom, like, you know, immediately explode the tube in the factory, right? And like the lab setting. And then Sony executives are like, ship it anyways. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. yeah, I know. All that high voltage going around in there, you know, cranking it into these components. Yeah, it's just, it's cool that it's possible to do that. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's clearly there these are not made for just a consumer right versus the pvms which i think pvms based on what i've seen at least they were used by like video editors and you know they were on people's and they used like that Mm. right whereas the pv or the bvms are very clearly were like studio stuff that wasn't really intended to be used like in somebody's house (laughs) Right. It's the impression I get anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely <laughs> right. And like you said, the PVMs, um, the PVMs don't have as much basically hardware. Or, or that's the when you when you finally own a PVM mm-hmm. versus a BVM, you notice just the immense size uh-huh. and like hefty heavy dutiness uh, between the two. And the reason is is because you get all that extra hardware. And vice versa on the um, the PVMs, it's a lot. They're a lot more stable, and like you're not you're not as able to just sit there and really mess them up by cranking up all the settings as easily. Yep, absolutely. Have either of you guys ever found a use for that card slot that's on some of the input monitors? Looks like P- PCMCIA. I think it's supposed to load firmware oh, yeah. updates or something. Have you, ever can... used that? have you ever used that, John? Yeah, John, have you ever had I to use not... that? I have not actually, I don't have one of those cards and I haven't used them myself, mm-hmm. but as I understand it, you can like save presets. Uh, there does seem to be things I've seen in the options menu that like correspond mm-hmm. to like saving. If you want to save this data, you can save it to the card. So I suspect like Steve actually has one there. Yeah, I actually have is. one of the cards here. These things are awful. Oh, These back. are 64K... Expensive. Oh, man. 64 kilobytes of SRAM oh. data. And, like, I've never even used this card. It came in one of the remotes I have. And, um, yeah, you can save settings, and you can transfer and update, like, firmware via this mm. system. Oh, the okay. problem is, is when uh, – thankfully, I think people have come up with better solutions. But when you had to – you know, you'd have to find a computer that was capable of writing data – to these oh, man. specific like style laptop. of cards, right? PC, so, I think you can grab them from AliExpress, such PCMCI maybe. readers. I don't know, but it's still a little bit like old school technology. Like if you find, yeah, old, yeah. so but it's that's, possible. That's the, just a relic, is all that is really. That's kind of like using um when settings on a an FW nine hundred. There's no like service menu. You have to do it through like a serial cable. And that was kind of finding like a an adapter to let me see your cable into the special adapter on the pinout on the FW nine hundred was kind of a pain. And then like modern PCs don't really want to deal with it. 
and uh, I eventually did find work, and you're using like old software from the '90s to do it. And yeah, it's like the Windows in there stuff, right? Yeah, the Windows stuff. It's it's such a it's such a pain, honestly. And <laughs> it's in like the BVMs where you actually have an on-screen menu. You're like the FW is yeah. like, no, you got to go in here. And when I first got my FW nine hundred, for whatever reason, they cranked up the G two voltage, so it made the like, and that's all done by horrible. software in that. Model. Yeah. You can't like go and manually you turn it You can't manually do it. You have to go through this software method to actually change it. And so I had to go through the whole calibration and I back, but getting that all together, getting the cable, getting the hardware to, to actually work with it, it took a while. It was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, man. Uh, I don't know. Lewis, if you have any other things, I thought maybe I would ask John one more topic here because we're getting close to an hour. Yeah, let's go for it. Sure thing. This is always something I get a lot questioned to me. And I don't feel like I'm nearly the good enough person to talk about it. Um, I mean, because my, my I don't I mean, there's nothing like special about what I do. But, John, I really want people to if you mind explain a little bit about your process of actually filming or uh, taping CRTs in action, because um, you have some uh, of the best yeah. footage out there on the Internet. Of, for example, the FW nine hundred uh, yeah. and other. I mean, every time I see one of your retro videos that involves a CRT, it just looks phenomenal. So, I don't know if you want to say any sure, sure. secrets happy, about what you do. Or I'm happy to share that. Go ahead. It, yes, it is actually tough, uh, as you know. Um, and you know, it starts with the camera itself. I'm I'm using the Panasonic. Uh, the newer ones also are. A good option, although, as I understand, the GH6 has some issues right now with the synchro scan, so it's one to avoid for now. But essentially, I use a mix of so I use the GH5 synchro scan feature, which is you dial in the shutter, the shutter to match synchronize with the refresh, uh, which isn't it's not super necessary for just raw 60 hertz kind of capture, but if you're doing like an arcade board or a console with a slightly weird refresh rate, you kind of want to use that's like a 57 or 58 hertz or some kind of weird refresh rate, then you really need to dial it in just right so you don't get the flicker. Uh, and then I also really focus on, visualize it, is I use my, my large uh, OLED TV as a viewing monitor. So, like, I use HDMI out from the camera to the TV because when it's that, you very carefully adjust the focus manually oh. and immediately seeing in 4K uh, how it's affecting the image. Because if you're just a mm. little too sharp, or it'll end up, you create these patterns everywhere, you know, like the lines going through it. So you want to get mm. it just a little bit out of focus. Like, not too much, but you just got to just watch carefully. And you actually see as you kind of move just slightly in an inch, you want to get it just a tiny bit out of the sharpest focus because you don't want the camera to pick up all the little phosphors. So if it does that, you're going to get a super noisy image that doesn't scale. It's blurring it enough to like essentially blend the phosphors together, but it's still sharp enough that you get a nice scan line effect and it looks pretty good. Uh, and then I also, of course, spend a lot of time on like the CRT, so I place like lights aiming behind the chassis. So you're kind of lighting the area around the CRT, but you don't point the light at the tube itself, right? Hmm. You but light still light the scene around it so that it kind of gets a nice balance. You can use a decent ISO setting. So it's really just a matter of very carefully playing with those settings, you know, making sure properly with the shutter speed. Uh, make sure you're not like focusing too much on the phosphors because it's going to be a mess. And if you do it just right, uh, it should look pretty good. Test, you know, you're looking at that test screen, but also, you know, do some test recordings. And I always recommend just like taking that raw video you just filmed and try resizing it, like make it bigger, just make it unevenly scaled. And that'll kind of give yeah, you yeah. an idea of how YouTube will treat it, right? Because most people watch YouTube, YouTube scales arbitrarily based on your screen res, right? Uh, and that's the for fine detail, and it's the reason why you don't want to like capture gameplay with like fake scan lines enabled because it's going to look horrible on there because it's always improperly scaled when with CRTs. And you want to make sure you get a little bit of fine grain detail out of there so that it can cope with all the different scaling. So 
that's I guess that's basically what I do. And it seem I'm happy with how it's been looking. So well, that's some great explanation and some awesome tips that uh, I didn't even know. So I'll definitely mm-hmm. try out. Yeah, give it a uh, shot. Hope work. that yeah, I hope that people really who stayed around and will mm-hmm. enjoy that clip so that they can because uh, I mean that's that's something that that little explanation will save me a ton of time. <laughs> tell yeah, people, that's, I, hope I so. mean, because that's a that's a great <laughs> way to. I mean, just even the little tip I never thought about of running it to your OLED display to see what it looks like. Um, and just yep. the little, the little things you're doing there. That's yeah, like, that makes it easier on the camera. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. Finder in a camera is too small. You can't really see it. Like pick out the fine green detail. So putting it on a giant screen, which <laughs> in a way is kind of what PVMs and VVMs were originally designed for, right? They were like preview monitors, mm-hmm. to like filming or, or working in video with. So we're kind of like, you know, moving forward with that same concept to film them. <laughs> uh one one Next thing to note, when you though, did the street oh yeah oh, sorry i was just just gonna say real quick mm-hmm. um the the focusing on the phosphor thing that does actually vary based on the type of crt uh that's like that so like a really high res high line count tube is going to behave differently than like a a 400 line consumer tube and some of those consumer mm-hmm. tubes with the with the more visible grid those can actually be a little bit tricky to film because the camera more easily picks up those elements. Whereas on like a, a BVM, those little phosphor elements are way tinier, right? Just a little out of focus mm-hmm. on that. So it does take special care that varies per tube type. So do you feel uh, like you'll... you have an easier, sorry, Lewis, an easier exactly. time filming the, uh, like a pro monitor is that easier yeah. to set up for now than just like a consumer set i i think so uh i think they're definitely a bit easier i sometimes like to film those little nine inch ones and those are obviously because they're they're quite tiny and those are actually a little bit tricky for that same reason and you know trying to film off a consumer set i've had some of those same issues before uh not that i really do that for my video with them and yeah it's just the pro monitors i think they put out such a clean crisp image it's very easy to just like dial in your lens to be just right mm. also you want to you want to make sure you have um i i so i use a 25 millimeter fixed focal point lens for filming my crts which gives it has somewhat narrow field of view for where between where it's sharp and where you have depth of field and that's actually super useful for crt filming because you can just you know the a couple millimeters one way or the other and you're moving in and out of like super sharp focus and like slightly less focus and you also get a nice depth of field behind the crt that looks really good it helps highlight the sharpness of the screen and it's it's all that stuff so you got to pick the right camera the lens the setup (laughs) it's it's all there all right, nice. So, John, what's uh, what's on your your plate for the rest of the week? Are you still working on VR stuff right now? Is that still? I'm, you, I'm about done Resident with that Evil for now. And then, yeah. yeah, okay. I'm done with that for now. Uh, a new DF Retro episode where we're looking at the entire Road Rash series. So that okay. should be a fun cool. one. Uh, I'm working. Okay. So all the variants, three D, the so, whole thing. Yep. From the original Mega Drive Genesis games all the way up through the uh, the final ones like Road Rash 3D and stuff like that. So, we'll be, oh, awesome. I got to get the ball rolling on that. And yeah, if you can, if you can that's, manage that to be pry next. yourself away from uh, Hero Wars for a minute, <laughs> oh, <laughs> we were laughing so much about this. That picture, Dude, that that a thousand that words advertisement has like <laughs> been making me laugh like it's something that you can just look at real quickly and kind of laugh at but then you start looking at it more and you're like what is, is it exactly going on in this thing it gets <laughs> it seems consensual with the horse <laughs> she's yeah she yeah. seems happy to be there with the horse she doesn't I, I seem told distressed Lewis, it looked to me like the guy was a voyeur and he like was <laughs> You know, I, I'm like, what is the hero here? Which one's the hero? The horse? I 
<laughs> it's so oh my goodness. In the last couple of months, they've been moving into this super weird territory. You got ones where he's like sitting on the toilet and then he gets like blasted <laughs> through the wall with like explosive <laughs> diarrhea. And you, what are they even doing here? It's just. Oh, it's, it's, it's got to be just work at the numbers. I mean, it's all analytics, those mobile sales games. It's all just guys with spreadsheets, A B tests. Oh, you gosh. know, they're running a million different variants it's of like, it. So de- they're, just, they're desperate. Yeah. They're like, we don't yeah. care, man. This guy, this, this is our last desperation attempt to get mm-hmm. this app to fire off. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, man. so we were cracking up about that one, though. So I couldn't let you no, leave without that's, mentioning that's that. That's pretty one. funny. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, John, we'll let you go and enjoy your evening, mate. Thanks very much for being on the Cathode Ray podcast. Of course, people know where to follow you, Digital Foundry, on Twitter. And uh, yeah, Steve, John, thanks very much for hanging out today. Of course, it was a pleasure. See you you later. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.